Hello, friends, and welcome. This is Syracuse Sports. I'm Brent Dax. Thanks for hanging. We appreciate that. It's been a busy week here in, in podcast land. We had a conversation recently with Syracuse offensive coordinator Jeff Nixon. We chatted earlier this week with Kelly Gramlich from the ACC Network and ESPN about Syracuse women's basketball, their path to March Madness, DeAsia Fair, what makes her such a special basketball player. We talked with Patrick Stevens, bracketologist extraordinaire, to see if Syracuse has a path to March Madness on the men's basketball side of things. And we didn't stop there, friends. We had a couple of post-game shows in there. We're going to have a post-game show coming after Syracuse takes on Louisville on Saturday. And this show, get ready, friends, Uncle Ricky Beast, four-time All-American Rick Beardsley, stops by to talk Syracuse lacrosse. Can Syracuse lacrosse become a power again? If they're going to do that, they got to start beating some of these top 10 teams on the schedule. And boy, they are right there. This close to doing that. Two top 10 losses recently, both in overtime for the Orange. Maryland and then Army earlier this week. We'll get Ricky's thoughts on those games. This team, Gary Gate, John Oderna, the new defensive coordinator. And guys, when we have uh, Uncle Ricky on, he tends to go off on some tangents and stories become stories. And uh, he kind of gets off uh, fr- the highway onto some country roads and we kind of have to bring him back. But that's why we love him. He's passionate. He's opinionated. He's honest. And no one loves Syracuse lacrosse more, and frankly, uh, almost nobody loves the sport more than Rick Beardsley. So a pleasure to welcome him back here on Syracuse Sports, and I think you'll enjoy the stories that he has to tell and his analysis of Syracuse lacrosse as well. We love our Syracuse Sports insiders. You guys have been incredible, not only this week, but all along here, in sending us your thoughts, your opinions, your questions, things you want to hear on the podcast. We recently did an Ask Brent Anything podcast and you guys brought some amazing questions to that so keep it up it's been great the back and forth's been amazing and as a Syracuse sports insider you get my opinions any news I have to break questions comments from me it comes first and we love the back and forth during games it's like a big group text everybody just kind of blowing off steam while we watch Syracuse sports it's been incredible and we would love for you to become a part of the Syracuse sports insider community all you have to do is text the word orange to 315-847-3895 you get a sign up link you sign up by the way try it free for two weeks how cool is that check it out see what it's like to be a part of the syracuse sports insider community and then it's just 3.99 a month after that you get exclusive access to me you get uh, your highlights uh, your comments, I should say, highlighted on our Syracuse basketball post game show and this podcast as well. Your comments and questions help shape what we ask our guests here on the podcast, and certainly topics have sprung from many text conversations with you. So become a Syracuse Sports Insider today. All right, get yourself ready, friends. Let's hear from him, the one and only Rick Beardsley. I'm all American, but more importantly, one hell of an American, ladies and gentlemen. Back on the Syracuse Sports Pod, Rick Beardsley, Uncle Ricky Beast. How the heck are you, my friend? How are you there, Axe? Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. I'll try and do a, a better job of being serious. I've always at one no, point no, been serious when we've been on the phone, you know, during the radio shows. And I, I often think that I, I must be really bad at the interviews because I often shed light or break chops and I don't know. And most of the guys I listen to, right, they don't do that, Axe. So yeah. I don't I don't want serious Uncle Ricky Beast. I don't you know, I, I will I will I will end this Zoom call right now if okay, that's what I'm well, getting. I'll, I'll I want be I want to time being you know, when, when, when we have to, right? I will I want to unleash the beast on this okay, show. Okay, let's do it. I actually have a pop quiz for you to start off with here. Okay, so I have my handy dandy Syracuse media notes. Okay. Uh-huh. Do you know where you stand? In Syracuse lacrosse history, because you are on the front page, baby. I am. Pole goals. Oh, the pole goals, I would have to say I'm two. You are dead on, my friend. I want to go yeah. through the list, though. Number six, Sam Alexo. Now, this is actually total points, 15 yeah. points. Yeah. Number five is Marshall Abrams at 17, tied with Brett oh, Kennedy. Was he good, man? Oh, he was Marshall Abrams, great not player. Brett Kennedy. Sorry, Brett. You weren't that good. You, you might be in the PLL, <laughs> but whatever. So go on. Chad Smith at number three, 18, Rick Beardsley, 20. Uh, you know who's number one? Yeah, that would be Joel White with ease. 
That's correct. Twenty-eight points. points. Yeah, points. yeah twenty. Points. Actually, only eight. So there you go. The poll you know, goal. Let me take that back. Brent Kennedy did have a, a good career. He was handicuffed, uh, handy, handicuffed, handicapped a bit with him having, you know, he was running close defense when he should have been between the lines, causing chaos. So I take that back, Brett. So my apologies, my Brett. We're just we're just breaking chops. But I will that. say this: uh, Joel White. Hmm. One thing I can say is, is obviously a first ballot Hall of Famer. I have not been a first ballot Hall of Famer. Um, we could talk about that for days. Uh, you know, I never ran a single one single run as a long stick midfielder. How about that one? I never. That's ran incredible. That's incredible that, that you would just go from the other side of the field. Joel White, that was part of this his transition game. Sam Alexo, same thing. Like he same comes thing. off the face off. Yes. Did you ever do face-offs? I took three face-offs in my entire career. <laughs> oh, wow. Coach Coach Donnie used to say, Ricky, you're going to get used to face-offs. And I like, you know, he'd have that hard upstate accent. Um, and uh, I took three in three playoff games. How about that one? And I was, I don't know if I, I might be like two for three. And it was really just because like a push or I like somebody kicked it to someone so I think I'm, I might be two for three, but he used to say, get ready to take face-offs, and it would be hilarious. Then we'd be in the Final Four, a national championship, and he'd go, all right, go take the face-off. I'd be like, what are we doing? <laughs> <laughs> so it was like, I, you know, stand up and swing is basically, you know, it was, it was stand Grab up and bat. Yeah. That yeah. All I'm right, Ricky. Honored by that. It's funny that was on the front of the list. Yeah, That's right on the front, man. I looked at that. I said, there's our guy who's going to be on the pod this week. So I really I want to talk to you about a number of things, but we can kind of connect the two. So you have the mm-hmm. Army game, Syracuse loses in overtime by a goal. Same thing, Maryland, a couple of weeks ago. The good news is Syracuse is giving top 10 teams this kind of run. I think last year, although Syracuse has played well against Maryland in recent years, but you look at this team even last year, I don't think you're pushing this towards overtime. I don't think you – no one can match Army's physicality but Syracuse did as best as it could in that department. Army only had one man up situation. Syracuse had five, which we're going to get into, right? They're going to go through that film of that Army game, and it is going to sting because there are so many opportunities that were there. Christian Mulet had an open net. Joey Spillane's behind the back shot. I mentioned one for five on man ups. I can go through about 10 other plays mm-hmm. that sure. could have swung this game. But how are you looking at this from the standpoint of, They're right there. They're taking a team that was a goal away from the Final Four last year into overtime, and there's plenty more of these games to come. It's a a great lead-up to a great question. How am I taking it? Me personally, I take it as if it's, you know, a a great leap towards what can happen, right? So with all those little bit of mistakes, you have new kids, new coaches, you have a new philosophy, right? So you're only, you know, you're still two years into this thing with Gary you have a new defensive coordinator. You're learning every week. He made some great adjustments. Coming out in the zone with 20 seconds left, it was great. Um, I, I, that's the old John Desco move, believe it or not. He, John Desco, would, you know, he was notorious. I don't know why, guys. You know, Obviously, there was not the way people scouted, but that he was notorious for coming out uh, with like under a minute, minute 30 into a zone right off the bat. Mm. And it would take, you know, that's why we learned as our coaches, number one, we learned that come out and if they go into a zone, you just say it, if you go into a zone, hit a 14 and then you're good to go. But I think, um, you know, the one goal losses are one goal losses, right? The, the better team, according to the rankings are winning. You can't win a goal, win a game by a half, by a half goal act. So, Right now, the experts are getting it right. Now, the good thing about that, people can say, are you making excuses? There's no real excuses I'm making. This is uh, a team that needs to keep getting better moving forward, right? Moving forward. So, uh, you know, the five man ups, right? You know, the ball wasn't maybe as as crisp and clean as it should have been, okay? Uh, Banged around. Uh, you know, missed a couple of shots. It hit a couple of people. But again, on the Army side, they did that too, right? Syracuse soaked a bunch of things. Um, you know, people could blame officiating. Uh, you know, there was a lot of things that 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 pointed in this game. But for me, I feel I feel really good in the direction they're going. Uh, this is not the '90s. I am very well aware of that. Um, you you're not you don't have everybody's top guy. There's a ton of parity in the game. Um, 
and you know, you're trying to piece it together with the transfer portal. So there's a lot of moving parts on a team that, you know, hopefully just keeps getting better and better and better. But for me, I feel good about it as an alum. I've, I've gone to the social media to defend them. Uh, and, you know, guys are giving me, you know, a little bit of crap and, and that's fine. Comes with the territory because all is right in the world acts when people start to hate Syracuse lacrosse again. That's the that's the other side of it. You know, like you said, the game has grown and so many more teams are, are final four caliber. And I love that. I love that the sport has grown like that. But when <laughs> there's going to be some real freezing cold takes about Joey Spillane in particular that I want to get to. But when people are reacting to Syracuse lacrosse this way, it, it does show how close they are. And you brought up the portal. Yesterday's game, for example, we're talking on Thursday here. This is going to be released to the world on Friday. But mm -hmm. Christian Mule, three goals. Sam English. Three goals. Instant impact from the portal right there. Mixed in with Jackson Burt Whistle. And these guys had to step up on the offensive end because heavy wears the crown of the 22, Ricky. I, I think people are going to really regret some of the things they're saying about Joey Spillina and how he doesn't come up in big games. And I think he's going to be fine. I think if, if you've watched five minutes of that kid play, you can just see the raw talent that's there. But... Have you wears the crown of the 22? The expectation mm -hmm. is you're going to have more than two assists in a top 10 game. You're going to have more than three points against Maryland. So there's an adjustment there. Both Gary Gate and Mule, speaking of him, jumped in at the press conference to defend Joey and the pressure that's on him, which I understand. But I think what we've got to keep in mind, Ricky, is he leaned into that pressure. He wanted the 22. Mm -hmm. He embraced yeah. it. So there's a balancing act going on here. I, I think... I do think in Joe in Joey's instance, you know, I don't think people might know the whole story, right? So, you know, yesterday the game plan, most likely the way I saw it was let's attack all the short sticks. Now, Joey being a coach's kid, it's very different than having Casey Powell. It's very different than having Charlie Lockwood. It's very different than having Mikey Powell. It's very different than having the no, numerous sets of 22s. OK, this is a modern day type offense. These are, you know, it's, it's more of a settled type offense. It's a one on one base play six on six. You know, in my opinion, I already know what the game plan was because I speak to Joey all the time. So you're aware, right? You know, the, the game plan was to attack the short sticks. And when that happens, superstars have to take a back seat. Now, Joey is not the guy that's going to buck the system. So guess what? When he's asked those questions, he has no answers because he's not going to defend himself classlessly. Whereas, you know, maybe guys like me can do that, right? Or, you know, you know, the coach Coach Gate can step up and take his players like he did. And Mule did, and as Mule, I mentioned. Yeah. The Mule family. Let me just say this on a side note. If you know the Mule family, then you know that they're some of the toughest, most straightforward people in the world. Jimmy Mule's I mean, Christian Mule's dad and his uncle and his uncle Gerard. This is a true story. May God strike me down, Ax. <laughs> I dunked one in a tournament out in Greenpoint, New York. Okay. Dunked a lefty with my goalie, my D stick. Boom. Talked smack to Jimmy Mule, who, by the way, is Christian Mule's dad, and didn't realize that his brothers were all on the field. <laughs> it's a true story. How'd that go? Gerard Mule right in my face. Like, Try, I'm like, yeah, because, you know, you're acting big and bad. So you're on the field and then yeah. the game's over. And then guess what? It wasn't over for them. Oh, no. I got chased down the LIE, basically. Oh, this is a very true story. Chased down it. They were trying to catch up to me, mess with me, slow down. It was. <laughs> I, that is it's a continued off the field. I love it. Oh, my God. An hour till I hit the till they had to get back to where they're from. So good lesson. Fact. Don't mess with the Mule family. No, I mean, yes. so, you know, being, you know, being number 22 at Syracuse means something. And you're right. Can you criticize points? Sure. He still averages four points a game. Oh, I didn't do this in the game. But you know what? What did he do? He allowed for others to they don't slide off him. He also draws the best matchup. Maybe the best matchup for certain teams is the most intelligent D guy. So guess what that does? That holds the slide, maybe makes their communicator get quiet. So there's so many things people don't understand in the nuances of the game. And that's OK. I'm not ripping on a casual fan or, a, you know, but Coach Simmons used to always say that fan was short for fanatic. Those are certain things you remember in your career, especially a guy like me who 
I caught so much grief from opposing fans, right? Because of my antics. And, you know, I used to have to understand that that was part of what's going on, the criticism. And, and now that with everything, like we're on, we're on a computer right now. Who thought we yeah. would be on a computer talking on a podcast of, you know, doing a video here, you know, back in the 90s. So it has changed. I will say this, you know, if you get to know, you know, who that kid is, he's a team first guy. Whereas I can tell you that when, if you came out of a timeout and the ball wasn't going to go in Roy Colsey's stick, Roy Colsey would have walked up, taken the ball. And when Doug Jackson or somebody said, Hey man, I'm supposed to take it. He would have said, go away and take it on his own. So that's maybe where people are not understanding. If you look at the, if you look at the timeout, they were very candid about what Pat March drew up. And, and, and now again, that's not my own personal opinion. I mean, that is my personal opinion. I do think they need to use it more because, like you said, there's a reason why he was the number one player in the class. Well, Gates said he, he's got to move a little bit more off ball. they got to put him in motion. Yeah. Look, Army's got a great defense, and there of were course, times – I'm going to say yeah. that Syracuse's offense was not its typical self, meaning it was one-on-one -on -one and everybody stand and watch. There was no movement. I mean, it wasn't even like where you dodge, throw a pass to the adjacent – get it back and then go. So it creates what? It creates a new approach, a right. little bit of a D shift. It can make separate some things. They were very stagnant. And I think also yesterday, I know you didn't ask me this, but I'm going to tell you, I thought we should have picked up the pace a bit. Army wanted a six on six game. They did. I didn't think they wanted a run and gun game. So maybe if we pushed, pushed it with early offense, and that also leads into the short stick D midi play, which is, they're still trying to figure that out. You know, Brett, Jake Spelina played excellent yesterday, right? And I think, you know, with more work, that unit's going to get better. Ricky, uh, I want to get your perspective on the defense, of course, being a defenseman. And you got John O'Durno running the defense. Now it comes from Manhattan. All the numbers were impressive. I think they had the least amount of goals given up the past two years and different philosophy than Dave Petromala, who Petromala is a legend, and I think it was a smart move on Gates' part to see if it would work. It didn't, and everybody moved on, and Dave's with his kids now at, at North Carolina, and no harm, no foul. Adernia brings more of a connectivity. He's younger. He, you know, this guy's, he just played, what, 12, 13 years ago. So yeah. I think there's there's a generation gap that that's closed there. But what have you seen from his defensive philosophies? What have you heard about how he's running the defense, and just from what you've seen about what he's trying to do with it? I mean, I, 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 we, I mean, I know Coach Aderna from, you know, in his days of an assistant at Manhattan and when he got the head coaching job, you know, I'm in the lacrosse world selling in it, you know, the apparel side and the equipment side. So I deal with college coaches on a daily basis. I work, you know, some of the best showcases in America, Maverick Showtime, 1% Showcase, NLF Futures. Uh, yeah, I worked those two under, you know, the New Balance events. Now I worked the Nike All-Star game. So I, I'm working those boys events. So I, I often have interaction, and, and he's been nothing but great. Um, you know, not many Manhattan games were on TV. So when the job came up, and, you know, you and I spoke, and I said I had interest. Mm -hmm. You know, you were nice enough to pop that piece in there, and I'm sure that got a lot of clicks, which is good. Um, and, you know, he's done, in my opinion, he's done a great job. Uh, remember, he has kids that he didn't recruit, okay? Yep. He's got to deal with whatever is there. And I mean that with not a, not a no negative connotation. He has to deal with what he has there. So now you're talking about going from maybe a very complex slide scheme that maybe those kids were trying to wrap their heads around at with with Coach Petromala to you know John Aderna, who maybe he's dumbed it down because let's face it, the athlete he's getting at Manhattan College is going to be a little different than the athlete he's going to get at Syracuse. So you know, and I, and I mean that with respect, athlete, not lacrosse player, athlete. People are recruiting athletes on the defensive end of the field these days and then turning them into what they want. Now, the biggest bonus that they have is really, I'm going to say this, Billy Dwan III is like a third, is, is a coach. His dad, his uncle, uncle's at Loyola, I grew up with those guys, very lucky. Uncle is the defensive coordinator at Loyola. Dad was the associate head coach for a gazillion years at Hopkins. Billy Dwan has really stepped up. And I think he's doing things with the defense as far as Coach Aderna is that are, are, are he's working within what he has and making it and maximize. He's also still trying to figure out the combinations, 
right? We saw that with, you know, in the beginning of the game, it was Kakemo was on the close defense. And then all of a sudden, boom, when Jacob Moore, number 90, who I love from Army, he's the greatest kid from Auburn in the world. Who does Auburn not kid? Love yeah, local kid. kid. Who does not love that, that kid? And boom, Kakemo would shift up. Bang, Shorty would go down to his guy. So they were playing with some things early to figure out how it would go. So when you do that, that's what says to me you're trying to still figure out who the number one is or you have a bunch of guys that you're just trying to plug and play versus a matchup. Like maybe Kakemo was better. He could handle he, – as the fourth guy, he can handle being up top, right? But if it's down low and he gets stuck, he's going to be able to handle down low. So he was versatile, right? Whereas – you take 51 right off the bench, you know he's a long stick. You can tell he's a long stick, right? San Alexo was probably their best cover guy, but you lose a lot of him if you put him down low. So he's yeah, trying to plug and play the best way that he can with his defense, at least from my standpoint. And then, I, you know, you talk about the short stick D middies. Now, please, folks, don't kill me for this one. I was wondering who the ball boy was in the number 19 jersey. Like – I was really trying to figure out who Paul Boy was on the field. This is He's got wheels. I'll tell you that. I'm glad that he does. Okay. I'm glad that he does. But he got stuck on defense and exploited. Wyatt defense. Hoddle. That's your guy, yes. Wyatt Hoddle. 100 guy. 5'7, 150, Westminster, Maryland. Freshman. Yep. And Yep, and he's a Calvert Hall guy. He's well coached. But I'm going to tell you, boy, he played a lot yesterday. And guys like, you know, <laughs> Guys like they're, guys like they're all at Roa. They're sitting on the bench. Like, come on, like you, you know, with the faceoffs. Mason Cohn was up against it yesterday. Really tough time. It was fifty eight percent? I think it was. I got it in my text string of guys because I have obviously Joey's dad in my text string with a bunch of big guys that are coaches in college uh, that are at my believe it or not fantasy football league, which I'm well. The at. interesting thing was. They split Cone and John Mullen at the faceoff yeah, X. And Will Coletti from I'm Army, who it, Will Coletti, in my opinion, is the best faceoff guy in the country. He took all 30 faceoffs. Yes, of course. Yep. But Cone, see, there's another difference, Ricky, that puts this team that much closer to where they need to be. And he's only here for a year, of course, as, as a grad transfer. But you needed somebody that I know. I'm the, hey, how you doing? I got the Tommy oh, DeVito thing going. Six yeah. skills. Oh, I thought you, I, <laughs> I like I that mean, too. I yeah. Any DeVito, I mean, what is it? Tommy DeVito does yeah. live down the street for me in Jersey, to be honest with you. There so, you go. Yeah, he go, does, over, go over and have some uh, some cutlets with Tommy Cutlets. Yeah, Tommy Cutlets. Anyway, I before I, I, I get off track and forget what I'm talking about here. Are you talking I, about the face-off guys? I kind of yeah. have. But, yeah, Cone, his hockey mentality, the physical nature of it, you need somebody that could punch back against Army. And like you said, the weird thing about that, that game was your typical – well, Syracuse Army game is like 9-7, right? This was a higher scoring game. Army's got a lot. They had four guys score three goals. They want to go. They have the athletes to go. And Syracuse kind of figured that out later in the second half. But until then, it was it, it was kind of a grind. And I thought they did such a good job matching their physicality. And, and But I think you made a good point. It kind of put them out of their game. So I think how Syracuse wins the next top 10 matchup when it comes. And there's plenty more. You mm -hmm. dictate the pace of the game. You make the I other agree. team adjust to you as opposed to the other way around, whereas Maryland and Army, I feel like it was a little bit more the opposite. I can tell you that one thing I learned, and I know that I'm just like a failed high school coach, right, apparently. but uh, State you know, champion learned, failed high school coach. Yeah, I, I know, yeah. I've learned a little bit in my day. And one big thing I've learned is even if you're outskilled, come out throwing punches put people on their heels right away. Now, I'm not saying that Gary has to do that. That is just my philosophy on the way I play, the way I coach. You know, when I've learned in the high school, the best thing about being a high school coach um, is not the parents, number one, but the other best thing about being a high school coach is that you have certain limited talent. So when you have, for example, I was at CBA for so long, they didn't plow fields. So I played a lot of unsettled in a gym. So when we got into a game, everybody was like, why are we, you know, why would we do six on six? No, I would go 180 miles an hour to create chaos because that's what my guys were used to playing in is chaos. Now I've learned teams that are athletic and disciplined like an army, 
Okay, extremely athletic, extremely tough. There is, listen, let's be honest, they're the toughest that they come. It's an armed force. We want these guys to be this. Yes, we do. We want them. Those guys, their alumni, thank you. Thank you for all the terrible comments you've said about me and and all the things you hate about (laughs) Syracuse. But I will never, ever underline the fact that, man, thank you for your service. Because the truth is, they have to be this way. And if you know what, blowing off a little steam and being proud of what Army is and beating up on Syracuse a bit, good. But my point is simple. That culture, that person that they have on that side of the field, you have to challenge with the things they're not used to. And on an athletic field, it's very, is almost like a battlefield. You know, you're, you're going to have to challenge them with that adversity. And then they're going to obviously regroup and come back at you, which they did. But you want to continue to just throw punches as much as you can. That's just me. I do think that that was the difference in those games, like you said, just not coming out swinging. you got to come out swinging. And that's the Syracuse way, at least from years ago. People say it's a different team. Yeah, but there's not many teams that come out in the, you know, swinging. So – Acts, you know, they're going to be challenged again, and, and we're going to see what they're made of again very soon. You brought up something, and we'll close on this note, Ricky, about Gary Gate. And I want to know what you think about Gary. This is his third year. I think there's some pressure on this team to go to the tournament, especially with uh, he was the most aggressive coach in the transfer portal, which we brought up. They're knocking on the door of these top 10 teams like they're showing they're capable. And at Syracuse, you, you can't miss the tournament. What would that be? Three years in a row? That's just unacceptable, right? Gary is who he is. And here's what I mean by this. He's not a yeller. He's not a screamer. He was yelling at the refs. I'll tell you that on Wednesday. That yeah. We could do a whole show on how bad that officiating crew was. Yeah. But I'm going to let that slide. And they were bad both ways, by the way. Exactly. Exa- that's exactly right. You took the they words really right were. out of my mouth. I mean, they yeah. missed the goal at the end. They missed the change of possession at the half. I mean, Joe Alberici, I've never heard curse. And boy, did he land base some yeah. F-bombs at, that, at those they guys on the you know? But we'll brush that aside. What can you tell me about what Gary's philosophy is as a coach and maybe if you've seen it evolve, if at all, since he's come in and, and taken over this program? Well, I think in the beginning when he got the job, it's a very different mentality of a, a men's coach and the, the ladies' coaches. The ladies' coaches all got along. They talked to each other at events. They did events together together. They never tried to stamp on each other's toes. They were more, how do you say it, ladylike. The men's business is a cutthroat, hey, man, whoa, you just missed me with that knife. (laughs) That is the recruiting aspect. That is the event aspect. Everyone is an alpha male trying to get theirs. And now you mix that in with ego, money, popularity, and you become what modern sports is becoming right axe i got a call today about uh from mark hayes with the nil initiative that they had that he works for you know him very syracuse orange united yep yeah so they called me and i I gave him a very honest opinion and i'll save that you can ask him what we spoke about (laughs) but i I do think that you know gary's first year might have not been expecting that also not expecting what maybe the team was right they were very undisciplined they were they were probably not as together and i know that they they went and talked to sports psychologists and worked on their shooting and they were working on the wrong things like for example i remember him saying to me he's like the guys would do step down shooting after practice with a bucket of balls when they were middies on the run instead of working on the middies on the run shooting now you're right when you have your certain craft You should master your craft. Now, that shooting does help, but really mastering and getting better is doing that extra work on the run, right? So, and in in the second year, it started to evolve more and more for himself, right? So, it's it's tough uh, to come in in a place that has the highest budget in lacrosse. He's the most prolific, probably besides Mikey Powell, I would have to say, Gary Gate, Mike Powell, two of the greatest that's have ever, ever, ever played the game. And the one thing I can tell you, Axe, at least the big recruiting play I used with Joey when I walked him through, because I remember when it was when it was COVID, the only human who had a pre-existing relationship that was legal and binding by the NCAA was me, right? So how lucky am I, right, to, 
to be able to talk to such a great young man, but to be able to walk him around the place where I lived, the place where I went, the place that I'm, you know, I've often been critical of, but often love so much and, and bleed so much of it. Um, and I remember walking up from the hall languages and I didn't even know what that building was acts till the second year, just so you know. <laughs> I was walking up the hall languages by that bench. What's the kissing bench where everybody mm -hmm. right? Yep. There. Great story and about said, that. You should look up. Yeah. You know, and I said, man, I looked at him and I said, man, doesn't this just feel like New York? And he just stopped and he's like, you're so right, Rick. This just feels like New York. I go, that's why it's New York's team, man. This is us. This is what we do. And that I get goosebumps talking about it because that is truly how I felt the first time I went to practice at Syracuse. And he has the same feeling as do a lot of those guys. And it goes a lot deeper for him, not because of the number. It goes by the last name. You have to understand that last name. It, it means a lot. His, his sister, his brothers, his dad, that's a, not a, you know, Angela Beardsley, my oldest daughter, told me one time, and I never realized, and I'm going to leave you with this. I know I'm long-winded. She said, Dad, do you know what it's like to have our last name? And I said, because all I think about is the positive. Right. Yeah, of course. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. It's the look best. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, why not? Look, you're good. Like, I come on here. She's like, no, at times it's not. And often it's not. People want, and I literally, I'll never forget it. She was smart enough to say that to me at 14 years old. Wow. Dad, dude, it's like when, if people find out that Soph, you, you know, that, that your dad, your Soph's dad, hold on a second. You're the guy that's, his dad's on the radio all the time. He's on the team, writes the art. Oh, I've, writes I've, this has happened. This is, we've had the same conversation. So I think this all circles back to what you're saying about what bigger name is there than Gary Gate? There is who's got a, more, who's got more skin in the game than he does. Do they have? Listen, exactly. when you're a yeah. star, I can tell you right now, you could say whatever you want. Any of those army people. Hey guys, you played at Syracuse. Good for you. Thank God. Cause you're on TV prime time. No one knows your kids' names. I'm not trying to be mean. It's just, it's known fact. Are you a final four team? God? Yes, they are. They're a final four team. I told you this already and they're excellent. But when you're at Syracuse, and you're a star at Syracuse, you are a star. It is very simple. End of discussion. Ricky, you're the best. Always appreciate your perspective. We are definitely going to do this again as we go through the season and, and down the road here because there's plenty more of great lacrosse to be played. But uh, always appreciate your time and your perspective, my friend. A real All-American, a real American, and the second all-time leading pole goal scorer in Syracuse. Can you send me that PDF? Because i got to post that on social media. You are going to blow it up, frame it, and shove it in the face of all the haters, my friend. I'd be happy to do that for you. We'll talk to you soon, Ricky.